sincere thanks to all the committee. I congratulate, actually, that we successfully moved from Bali to Jakarta in one week. <laughs> well, I think this experience, at least we can publish a book and teach us how to manage disaster when we organize events. Um, so, stop dreaming, guys. Um, uh, our, our last lecture actually brought you to the future. Um, so, we start to dream what we can do to have a cure of HPV. So this is a very concise lecture, it's just a glimpse of the future. Normally, we have a whole day workshop on this topic, but now my task is to bring you back to reality. What, where are we now? So the first lecture of uh, this session for me is on natural history. Is, is it still relevant? So why we ask this question? Because when we were still students, we were taught that hepatitis B, particularly if uh, one acquired infection at birth, well, we normally go through four phases. The first phase we call immune tolerance is when immunity cannot recognize a virus when we have a very high viral load, E positive, normal ALT level. And now we recognize that this is probably misnomer because there's some immune activities going on. So E will change the term to E positive chronic infection to avoid this misnomer of immunology thing. And then we move in the case of immune clearance, when the immune system wakes up, start to clear the virus, with TALT flat, DNA should go down, easy conversion, and then we move to low replicative phase. Some patients got in negative active hepatitis with uh, increase in DNA and ALT level, and some more fortunate patient loses surface antigen. But the relevance of all the natural history things actually starts not too long ago. That was about 10 years ago when our Taiwanese colleague first demonstrated the importance of HPV DNA and HCC. Because in this very famous review cohort, which composed of mainly negative patients and non cirrhotic patients, HPV DNA more than four locks the companies produce starts to increase the risk of cancer and the risk increases exponentially as DNA increase. So, when we go to the guidelines, so this is actually uh, a summary by Nora Terra in the 2016 ASLD guideline and look into the importance of the immune active phase in the natural history. And I think it is quite unequivocal that for patients in immune active phase, there is increased risk of all sorts of complications. So here's the, the summary of seven randomized control studies and 35 observational studies suggesting that in the active phase, increase the risk of cirrhosis, liver cancer, death, and also uh, decompensation. And we need antiviral drugs to treat them, and when we treat this patient, the risk can be reduced. So that's the reason why when we talk about natural history, although we can divide patients with different phases, but we have to remember very clearly what's the goal of treating them, and that's the relevance. Of the, of, of the natural history. So we need to think about mortality, complications, and by achieving histologic response, viral suppression, and biochemical normalization, we can probably achieve these long-term goals. So I think for natural history-wise, um, there are a few things that is disagree by all the recommendations. is that we need to treat patients in the immune active phase, regardless they're E positive or E negative. So it seems that the importance of immune clearance phase in the positive phase and the negative replic the reactivation replicative phase, or an easily called the negative chronic hepatitis phase, is not too relevant as at today. Because think about it: if you have a positive patient or a negative patient, if they have high DNA and high ALT, then you will always treat them. If a patient has got ALT above normal. DNA above 2,000 per mil, already got significant histology, we treat them regardless of the E-engine positive or E-negative status. For patients of cirrhosis, again, regardless of E-engine positive negative status, we will treat them if they have got detectable DNA, and obviously if they decompensate, we will treat them. So it seems that the, the importance of the E-positive E-negative active disease um, importance gets a little bit blurred. Well, but let's look into those patients with seemingly less serious disease. So this is just one example of Asian American series B positive patient with normal ALT and high DNA. And normally, we classify these patients as immune tolerance phase just based on the annual status, 
DNA in AFT. But when we look at histology, actually a significant proportion of them, almost more than a quarter of them, had significant fibrosis. That is F2 free fibrosis. So why do they have fibrosis if they're still immune tolerance? The answer is we cannot define immune tolerance just based on the DNA, AOG, and, 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 and the antigen. Because patients have tend to fluctuate disease, and the so-called normal ALT sometimes is actually not too normal, and ASLD has just revised the guideline to a very, very low AOT uh, uh, level to be normal. So we'll be very, very careful about this. So therefore, in all the guidelines, if we look into patients with uh, uh, abnormal ALT, but not yet two times something abnormal, if the DNA is high, particularly when they're older, so the definition of old is different. In American, 40 year old is old. In Asia, 35 year old is old. In Europe, 30 year old is old. So it all depends up to your your it's up to your decision and your uh, impression on your patients. Normally, these conversion should occur between 20 year old to 40 year old. And if a patient is still E positive at age of 40, it means that something must go wrong because E sequence should have started in these patients and probably has already started, but you just missed that. And these patients have a higher chance of advanced fibrosis. So for these patients, we recommend having a fibrosis assessment or liver biopsy. Make sure that we are not misclassifying an immunoactive patient as an intolerant patient. Now for family history of liver cancer and cirrhosis, a partial guideline and ESO guideline also emphasize that we should uh, biopsy this patient. But I don't think this is really evidence-based. Um, uh, uh, it's more on, on expert opinion. So same thing for yin negative patients. So for yin negative patients with normal AOT level, so this is again one of the many, many studies, and this is the biggest study from Taiwan, more than 3,600 patients for, for 13 years, and they found that only half of them were persistent normal AOT. In other words, it is very hard to define a E-negative patient with no ALT, whether they have inactive disease or they have actually E-negative active disease. And therefore, for all the guidelines, they recommend that we should think about fibrosis assessment if the DNA is high, that is more than 2,000, if they are older, or they have a family history of XCC or cirrhosis. And you can see that the all three guidelines actually do not agree with each other, what are the key criteria to consider fibrosis assessment? But at least we know that we need to consider this if we suspect that this patient might have negative active disease. And usually, for me, high DNA is definitely one of the criteria. Because think about it, if a patient really undergoes DC conversion, they really go into remission, why the DNA is still high? So this is unreasonable to label a patient with inactive disease. So a patient with DNA more than 2,000 per mil, I will always think about doing a fibrosis assessment. Now, age is actually more difficult because if a patient undergoes yeast to conversion which age of 20 to 40, even if a patient becomes inactive disease, he will grow old, right? One day is 60, another is 80. So we still first of all use age to define the risk profile of an inactive patient because if you can live forever, you can age of 100, and then you do fibrous assessment at age of 100, but not 40 years ago. So this is actually not reasonable to me. But DNA is definitely something we have to think about. So actually, ESO has published a, um, um, a recommendation when to use non-invasive assessment of fibrosis. Although these recommendations are integrated into the regular ASLD, ESO, and muscle guideline, but these guidelines have no detailed suggestion of how to use it. So ESO, in view of this a few years ago, Lauren Castell and I uh, worked with a group of experts who wrote to, to write this uh, 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 recommendation that on summarizing all the data, it seems that trans is the elastography, and most people use fibro scan, although there are different types of uh, trans elastographies nowadays, has a better prediction for fans fibrosis than serum biomarkers. The serum biomarkers we're talking about either the very simple APRI score or the more complicated, uh, uh, like, like, like fibrometer or, or fibro test. So the, the best use of uh, non-invasive assessment fibrosis is actually exclude advanced fibrosis in inactive carriers, or so-called inactive carriers, 
that is those which you are you are with no ALT, low viral load, and usually we do not deliver biopsy. But for patients with active disease, that is DNA more than 2,000 IO per mil, and we already confirmed that this patient has got a bunch fibrosis, actually we do not need to do a biopsy, we should go straight ahead for treatment. So then we can avoid a lot of biopsy, and based on our data, we can probably avoid 60% of different biopsies if we use in non-invasive method. For the remaining 40%, this method may not give you a very uh, confident result, and if you still worry about that, you may still need to go ahead for different biopsy. So look at the modern approach of HEPI. In the past, we always say that in the patient, appetite is B, we look at AOT level. If it's normal, it's probably inactive. It's either inactive DNA disease or immune tolerance phase. Of course, when DNA is here, we also look at the DNA. And if the DNA is low, we're happy. And if you are certain, we do a biopsy. But nowadays, everything changed. The drug targets virus. So there's no DNA, we don't worry about it. No matter what, we are not going to treat. If there's DNA, we look at the fibrosis. Because for early cirrhosis, even if it is normal, we treat. If we see the virus, we see a common sense cirrhosis, we treat, regardless of ALT. So ALT level becomes a much less important parameter in the two-day management of hepatitis B. So then, fibrosis assessment seems to be a key player in, the net, in, in, in assessing natural history today. Because when we eat positive patient, we always want to know that whether this patient has got immune tolerance or advanced fibrosis. Even ALT is normal. For negative, again, it is probably one of the useful tools to differentiate inactive carrier and advanced fibrosis, particularly when ALT is normal or close to normal. So this is integrated into the uh, natural history assessment. In the past, people do not talk about this because we need to puncture the liver. It seems to be a no man's land. But nowadays, it is easily accessible and this should always be considered when we manage natural history of patients. <coughs> now let's go deeper into immune tolerant patient. We read the ASLD guideline. Immune tolerance patient, a class are, are characterized by E positive. Very high DNA level, usually more than seven dots, because without immune clearance, the DNA should be very, very low. It's very, very high. If you see a patient with DNA six dots, don't cause this immune tolerance. There must be some immune clearance activities going on. Otherwise, the DNA won't be so low. And AOT should be persistently normal, and according to ACL guideline, is less than 30 for men, less than 90 for women. And based on their uh, summary, actually, there's no study demonstrating any viral is beneficial to reduce the complications. So remember the goals of treatment. So there's no data suggesting that treating immune tolerance patients can reduce XCC, reduce cirrhosis, liberated death uh, in these patients. But however, there are lots of potential harm, including cost of the drugs, size of the drugs, drug resistance, because remember there's a very, very high viral load. It's the easiest group to, to, to develop drug resistance, particularly if you're not using the first line treatment and these may outweigh benefits. So this is not recommended. So I want to show you some evidence why this is not recommended. So this is actually one study, a multi-center study uh, led by our group, looking at immune tolerance patients, or at least the positive patient with normal ALT and very high DNA. And we randomized this patient in tenofovir, in proposal fumarate TDF, or a combination study of TDF plus anthocytamine, which is a regimen used in HIV, but not a registered regimen used in HPV. But anyway, these are very, very potent antiviral drugs treated for four years, and we found that the DNA suppression was only 55% in TDF group and 76% in a combo group. So, in other words, this is a very, very low percentage, as you can see from all the published studies, because these patients are immune tolerant patients, they've got extremely high DNA to start with. But another reason why the suppression rate is so low is look at the yeast cell conversion rate. Only 5% in TDA group and 0% in combo group. Even if you do not touch these patients, read the papers in the 80s, the zero conversion rate in four years is somewhere about, say, 20 to 40%. So in other words, if you treat this patient with suppressor virus, probably you remove some of the antigen to the body and it will delay ECU conversion. You do not see ECU conversion. 
And because it's no issue commercial, it indicates that the body's immune system is not working. So without the help of the immune system, how can you bring the virus down? So that's the reason why it's so difficult to treat these patients. And actually in our center, because per protocol, we have to stop treatment for all patients. And we are one of the most obedient center. So we stop all patients and we reported the 20 cases in Hong Kong. We stop uh, 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 all TDF or the combo therapy after four years. So because these are immune patients, so we so this patient actually know advanced fibrosis, so none of them have decompensation. But at least within four weeks, all patients got HPV DNA go up and relapse to a very, very high level. Half of them have clinical relapse. That's AOD more than two times something than normal. And uh, then we, re we have to retreat some of the patients. And for those patients we retreat, actually almost none of them undergo ECU conversion. It's only for those patients we, we did not retreat, we, we saw ECU conversion. So apparently suppressing the virus in the immune tolerance phase is actually doing not much good, but you may delay ECU conversion in these patients. But another part of the spectrum is inactive carriers. So how about the inactive patients who have low DNA? What shall we do? So this is again what we need to learn from the natural history. Number one, let's read what the guideline says. And most guidelines say that if the DNA is less than 2,000, are you permitted normal ALT for at least one year of persistent need, preferably no different damage, we do not need to treat. The ideal guideline has one additional cause is that the DNA is between 2,000 to 20,000 IU per mil, persistent or ALT level, minimum inflammation, we can observe. I think you see a lot of these patients, I have a lot of these patients, they're fluctuating across the 2,000 mark, and we don't know what to do. And an easy guideline in recommends we can, we can observe. And mostly it's based on the Taiwanese data, because there's some Taiwanese longitudinal studies suggesting that if ALT is persistent normal, even AOD crosses 2,000 mark, it does not increase the risk of XCC and complication of cirrhosis significantly. But at least it tells us that, number one, we need to make sure that this patient has no advanced fibrosis. And again, I want to share with you that uh, the importance of fibrosis scan is normal AOD is the best patient group to use transient elastography because we know that AOD, high AOD, it may force the anyway the different stiffness and give us a false impression of cirrhosis, but in patient with normal AOT, presumably no inactive carriers, this is the most accurate group. If you have a five liver stiffness less, less than five, be very reassured. If it's less than six, probably you can be reassured the fibrosis should not be bad, but beyond that, you have to rethink whether it is really an inactive carrier or this patient already got some fibrosis. Oh, I have some interesting works that I can't check it out this morning. I apologize for that. <laughs> it's a transfer of computer, and and, uh, and although although there are uh, more than 500 ethnic groups in Indonesia, I think none of you can read this. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but I want to highlight it is that when we look at the DNA alone, there are actually some patients with DNA between 2,000 and the 20,000 line, and this is actually a great song. And it's very difficult sometimes to differentiate whether it's really an inactive carrier or it is actually a, a, a inactive hepatitis by just reading the DNA level and ALT. Even as no advanced fibrosis, but we are not sure whether this patient has with fibrosis progression with time. And we don't want to wait until the patient has cirrhosis and say, oh, this is an, an active patient. So what can we do? So HPSAG is a recent biomarker that we found that very useful in this scenario. So in a lot of scenarios, it's not useful. But in, in, in the differentiation with real inactive carrier, it's pretty useful. Because if you look at, the, again, this is a natural history study uh, conducted by our group almost eight years ago, that for inactive, inactive carriers, they tend to have a very stable and low HPSH level. It's somewhere around two log IU per mil, and it's much lower than those of in active disease, and it's much, much lower than a D-positive patient. In other words, for patients go, going in the D-positive phase, active disease and the inactive disease, there's a low clearance of the trapping virus, and hence reflected by the production of HBSAG. And in Europe, 
there are a couple of studies to look at for patients with DNA less than 2,000 IU per mil. At the same time, with HPCG less than 1,000 uh, IU per mil, these patients on follow-up, they tend to be natural disease. And the, and the accuracy is somewhere close to 90%. So you do not need to follow these patients for very long. If you check one HPCG, you can almost predict who will relapse and who will not. And this is the Hong Kong data again from our group showing that for those patients getting less than 2,000 IU per mil, SAG less than 1,000 IU per mil, the spontaneous S loss rate in three years is 5%, five years, 9%. It's very, very high, much, much higher than the natural history. But if the SAG is further lower than 100 IU per mil, 18% of our patients actually has S loss in five years, even if you do not do anything on these patients. So this is actually one, in, one important use of HPSHG in the natural history of hepatitis B. And the Taiwanese actually even show that this group of patients, that is low DNA, low SHG, have a very, very low risk of HCC. We're talking about less than uh, uh, 50 per 100,000 person years. And of course, we're talking about this is a very, very low risk group. And if there are no cirrhosis to start with, and this Sometimes we call this true inactive carrier. So this is further supported by the review study. Again, with DNA patient with no cirrhosis for for 17 years, if a patient has got DNA, even if it's between four to five blocks, and even if you're not sure whether it is actually inactive disease, check HPSAG level. If HPSAG level is less than 1,000 IU per mil, then that is a red bar or a green bar. You already see a much lower risk of liver cancer, and if HPSG is less than 100, the risk of liver cancer is actually 1.7% if DNA is between 4 to 5 blocks, and 1% if the DNA is less than 4 blocks. So these are the real low risk group, and you can use this marker to refine your natural history assessment and pick out the real or true inactive carrier from your, from your patients. So here is actually some uh, HCC risk score. I'm not going to go deep into the risk score and what are the components of risk score, but I want to highlight to you that some viral markers being used in the risk scores. Most risk scores use HPV DNA because this risk score developed in untreated patients. So in untreated patients, we're going to assess a natural history when we are confused about the natural history. Frankly speaking, HPV DNA is the most useful biomarker to use. E antigen is is present in the rich, in the rich B score, and SAG has been tried to substitute DNA. But frankly speaking, if you have HPV DNA, you may not need the rest. HPV SAG is only useful when you suspect true inactive carrier. E antigen is useful when you want to differentiate immunotorics or your inactive inactive carriers. So let's go back to our natural history. So it seems it is still relevant. Well, I must say that it is still relevant, although uh, uh, we still treat the active patients because we need to know who is immune tolerant and who has no replicative phase. Now, this idea is not as simple as in the past we think because we need to integrate a lot of fibrosis assessment into it, and then in the inactive patient, I will also integrate HPSH level into the assessment. But for those patients with active disease, it seems they're not too relevant. Because an ESO uh, guideline, they, they, they classify this patient as chronic hepatitis, and no matter the in positive or in negative, we will treat, and it seems to us that the treatment options are very similar nowadays. But in the future, nobody knows, as Professor David just talk, talk, talked to you about a lot of new drugs, and we do not know whether they work the same for in positive or in negative disease, and maybe they may become relevant again. So with that, I want to thank you very much for attention.